you have a Bible, Hebrews chapter 12 is where it will be this morning. Hebrews 12. Uh, maybe a familiar passage for some. Uh, we'll begin there in verse 1 in just a moment. In 1863... Um, there was a, a, an innovation, a project that was started in our country that uh, would literally revolutionize most of the way that we understood commerce in, in our country. This project became known as the Transcontinental Railroad. Literally changed the way that we saw goods and services. It maximized our economy. It increased our capacities in all sorts of ways. And, and literally the world would follow as a result of what we started with the Transcontinental Railroad here in the United States in 1863. The group of people who oversaw this project were um, really, really excited, obviously, about this endeavor. And they thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to have some sort of a uh, commencement ceremony, some sort of a celebration to uh, recognize the launching of this project? Not the completion, but just the launching of, of the idea. And they got together and they thought, you know, we won't do a ribbon cutting. We won't do that. Well, what if we did this? What if we drove the, the very, first, you know, uh, very first spike into the railroad as a way to commemorate the day, as a way to, you know, to remember when the project began? We'll drive the very first spike into the ground. And this group began to make plans for this event. And there was one person who was a part of this group who heard about the plans for this, in, this endeavor, this, this uh, show. His name was Collis Huntington. And Collis could not have been more disgusted with this idea. Thought it was embarrassing, that it was gimmicky, that it was totally out of bounds for them to be celebrating something that, that, that was not even really begun yet. And so he sent a telegram to these other people who were involved in the project, and it read just like this. He said, if you want to jubilate over driving the first spike, go ahead and do it. But anybody can drive the first spike. But there are many months of labor and unrest between the first spike and the last spike. Collis Huntington prophetically knowing that there is a great difference between starting well and finishing well. I was the best husband on my honeymoon. Don't ask Catherine anymore, right? It's easy to start well, to get a a graceful beginning, but finishing well is a much different proposition. You see, if we were to take a poll in the room today, I don't think anybody in the room would, would say that they don't want their lives to have meaning. There's this anxiety that creeps into each of us every so often about making sure that we're doing all we know how to do to finish well, to run the race in in an effective way to make our lives matter. Nobody in the room would honestly say, I hope I'm wildly unsuccessful in my life. Nobody would say, I I hope I die and I'm forgotten. Right? Like nobody is going to have that mentality of it doesn't matter. I hope people forget who I am. I hope that I, I, at the end of my days, I don't have any meaning in my life. No, we all have this innate desire, this purpose, this burden in each of us to want to make it count. But we also recognize the, the difference between starting well and finishing well. And the question on the table for us is not what we want to accomplish, but how do we go about accomplishing it? To go back to the railroad for a moment, it didn't matter the blueprints they had. It didn't matter all the plans, the dreams, the, the commemorative services they put on. No, what mattered was that they arrived at the day where they drove the final spike into the ground. That's how you win. There's a familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that kind of speaks to this idea of making our lives count, of of leveraging the things that God has given you and me in a direction that has impact for the kingdom of God in the world around us. And ultimately, the calling on each of our lives to steward our lives Well, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to give you some context on Hebrews 11 to set the table for us. Hebrews chapter 11 is what many people refer to as the faith chapter. It's this bullet point list, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who that is, but the writer of Hebrews uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 just hits them, boom, 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 list, list, list of all of the different heroes of the faith, people that trusted God and God was faithful. 
It's essentially, to me, it reads like the greatest pregame speech of all time. Right, like it's this, hey man, I know you're up against it, you're an underdog, you've got a big adversary, nobody believes in you. Uh, if you're a Tennessee fan, that's Saturday. Um, that hurt me more than I thought it would. Um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, uh, but there's this, this feeling of, hey, you need to remember the highlight reel of all of the different things that God has done. And so it reads that by faith, Abel offered a greater sacrifice than Cain. By faith... Noah built a boat that rescued his family. By faith, Abraham followed God into a new land. By faith, Sarah conceived a child in her old age. By faith, Moses resisted the command of Pharaoh and led the Israelites out of slavery. By faith, Joshua saw the walls of Jericho come down. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12. For the Bible says in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. The writer says, Because we have so many examples of so many real people who have gone before us whom God blessed because of their faith. Because we have seen God's hand in so many ways. Because we have so many reasons to trust God. He writes, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. I love the imagery that this writer uses here. It's the image, this analogy, the picture of life as a race. This is going to shock you. I don't do much running. I just don't, man. I, I, you know, I, it's not my spiritual gift. Like, it's not in my wheelhouse. I'm just, it's for other people. It's not for me. Um, and so, uh, but here's what I know about runners. Uh, they all have the same wardrobe. You do, right? For those of you that are runners, right? Everybody has the same material clothing, the shirts, the shorts. They all have the same brand. They, they, a lot of them go to the same, you know, Fleet Feet store to buy fancy shoes that work just the same as mine, right? Like they, they have these watches they all wear that look like they could launch a space rocket from them, right? Like there's just, they're, they all have this look. And is that supposed to be cute or something? Like, is that like, maybe it's one of those, I mean, I'm really offending runners today. Um, yeah, uh, just hang with me. Uh, but it, the reality is it ends up looking like they're in some uniform, right? That like, oh, okay, man, we get it. You're a runner. I, I, I really, we all understand. Let us eat our Krispy Kreme in peace, right? Like there, there's this moment where you, walk, you see somebody walk into a store and you're like, yeah, I get it. You shop at Lululemon, like you have all of the designer, she, all, all of it, right? The truth is those runners don't just wear that stuff because it's cute to wear it with your friends, they don't wear it because they, they like spending $400 on tennis shoes. They don't wear it for all of those other reasons. Why do they wear it? Because they were designed for runners. They're designed to be efficient. The gear is lightweight. It allows you to move freely. It allows you to move efficiently. It's comfortable and it's light. So as they're running their ultra marathons like serial killers, like ultimately they, they, they're not burdened by the heaviness. You don't see guys wearing winter coats in marathons, right? Why? Because they run with what allows them to, to move freely, to move efficiently. They run in a way that was designed for them. The Bible says that for us to run this race in life, we have to lay aside the things that weigh us down. To strip off, the Bible says, the things that will cause us to be inefficient. That will slow us down, that will crush us. The burdens that keep us from moving freely. The distractions that keep us from moving efficiently. The extra stuff that we were never designed to carry. The writer's essentially saying here, hey, this, this race is going to be tough as it is. You probably don't need to carry stuff that doesn't belong to you. This race is going to be a marathon. Life is going to get tough on its own. 
But don't get caught holding the bag on something that doesn't belong in your hands. Lay it aside. Get rid of it and run with endurance. More specifically, he even goes on here and he says it's, it's noted that the, one of the things that will weigh us down, that will trip us up, the writer says, is sin. Sometimes what trips us up is our own shoelaces. It's not someone else's fault. There's no finger to point at anyone else. It's us. That we take on the things that bring that inefficiency, that bring that distraction, that bring that burden. And and if I can just be totally honest with you this morning, and listen, I'm not trying to grandstand as some holier than thou. I, I, I make no claim to perfection or righteousness on my own. But one of the things that has grieved my heart more than most things in this world is the way that the culture inside of the church has taken a lighthearted approach to sin. Sin is not just some mistake. Sin is not an oopsie. Sin is not just the way it goes sometimes. No, sin put nails in the hands of God. The reason the Bible talks about sin so often and so frequently and so consistently is because of what it produces. John 10 10 says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, none of which I want on my, my afternoon calendar. But Jesus over and over again uh, lays into the reality of sin and it breaks my heart to watch Christians soften the edges of a deadly sword. And just to know it's, it's how it is sometimes. It's just life. Nobody's perfect. It's, it's okay. There's grace. All of that's true. There is grace. There is mercy. We just sang about mercy a moment ago, but the writer here is indicating, man, that thing is going to kill you. John Owen said this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. That's why Jesus takes such an approach to this. So the writer here even indicates the power that sin can have. When we allow these things to come into our lives, they don't rent, they own. They take up residence. They got a new address And they begin to slowly transform each of us into something we were never created to be. Adrian Rogers said it this way. He said, sin will take you further than you wanted to go. It'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it'll cost you more than you ever thought you would pay. The thing about the enemy is that he is so crafty sometimes. He's willing to play the long game. He'll slow burn this thing and just move us gradually, piece by piece, until one day we look up and realize that we are so much further from God than we ever believed. He's okay with just gradually, piece by piece, moment by moment, day by day, moving us a little bit further, a little bit down the line. He's willing to slow play it until one day we look up and realize, man, what, what happened here? You see, this fade doesn't happen overnight. That happens over time. Many of you in this room right now have not realized that over the last 15 minutes, this room has gotten progressively darker. Let me bring the lights back up to where we started. It's a slow fade, friends. It's a gradual shift. And it can happen without us even realizing it. It just gets dark. And we end up looking up, realizing, man, I am so far from where I used to be. The writer says, to combat this, to fight this, what does he say? He goes on in verse 2, and he says this, let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. So you want to fight the darkness, you run with endurance. This word endurance translates to persistence, to constance, to continuing in the faith and believing with the end in mind. It's not just this endurance of just the cheerleader off to the side. No, it's, hey, you have a goal and you're running. That's why the Apostle Paul would say in Philippians 3, very vulnerably, he says this, I press 
on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I love his honesty. He says, I press on. He goes, he goes ahead and grants that there's going to be a struggle here. He didn't say, I struck towards the goal. He didn't say, I coast towards the end goal. He says, I press on. I push through. I, I move forward. I stay the course. I do whatever it takes. There will be a struggle, but I am here for the fight. Why? Not because it's easy, but because it's worth it. Because it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Because he, he, he lists the heavenly reward. He says, I press on, not for my own gain, not for, because I'm strong enough, not because I'm good enough, not because everybody's watching me. No, I press on to get the reward, which is Jesus. That's what I stay in the fight for. So how do we do this? How do we run this race? Well, maybe you're convinced this morning, but you're like, okay, what is step one on the, on the path? I'm glad you asked because the writer continues in verse two and he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. I love when this scripture answers itself. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, now seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. I love the simplicity. He doesn't have a checkpoint of do these nine things and call me in the morning. He says, no, it's very simple. You keep your eyes on Jesus. Just stay right there. I was a basketball player growing up. That was my sport of choice and played in a lot of leagues. And there was a particular league I was playing in where, man, I was just getting worked on the defensive end. Right? Like I, I just could not stay with my guy. I was getting pummeled. I, I was, they were targeting me on defense because I just could not stick with it. And my coach pulled me over in practice one day and he said, Inman. I said, here it goes. He said, hey, I want you to stop looking at the ball on defense. He was like, Coach, the ball's pretty important in the game of basketball. It's literally in the name. Like, what do you mean, stop looking at the ball? He was like, no, you're getting worked because you're trying to follow the ball, and the ball's moving faster than your eyes. Here's what you need to do. Watch your man's waist. He said, he can't go anywhere without his waist. I said, okay. A little bit peculiar. And wouldn't, wouldn't it happen that that exact moment a light bulb clicked. The coach got to get in my face there and said, hey, you watch his waist. You are locked in. I, anything can be happening around you. There could, he literally said, there could be a guy in a chicken suit dancing at half court, and I don't want you to have any idea about it because you're locked in right here. And in all honesty, that changed everything about my defensive approach in basketball because I kept my eyes on who mattered. I kept my eyes right where they belonged. This is my man. I can't control where the ball goes. I can't control where he goes. I kept my eyes on who mattered. And I was all right. The writer here is saying the same thing, friends. You keep your eyes on who matters. There could be all kinds of stuff going on around you. There could be things going on in the world, the culture. There could be stuff happening at home. There could be all sorts of things ready to distract you. There could be a chicken suit at work. But the truth is, your calling, stay right here. What does the songwriter say? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. That's what the, the writer's saying here, man. It's not that hard. You just got to stay right there. Jesus has to become the, the filter through which you see everything in the world. Jesus has to become the center of your decisions. He has to become the center of your emotions. He has to become the center of your attention, the center of your focus, because where else are you going to go but to Jesus? Who can satisfy my soul like him? Where else are you going to go? He continues and he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. And he says, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. He says that Christ is the initiator, the originator, the founder, and the author. You want to know why keeping your eyes on Jesus matters? It's because he is where your faith literally begins. He authored it. 
He created it. Faith was God's idea. And beyond that, he said, the Bible says that he is the initiator and the perfecter. He is the completer. He is the finisher. So don't miss it. If Hebrews chapter 11 says that this race is run through faith, and Jesus is both the initiator and the perfecter of our faith, then that means, friends, that Jesus is standing at the starting line and at the finish line. So the question, how do I run my race that matters? I run it with him. How do I live a life that matters? I live it with him. How do I get to drive that last spike in the ground? I drive it with him. That's where it lives. And everything else has to fall. Jesus is not interested in a roommate. He's taking control. He's not sitting on the throne with anything or anybody else. And one of the scariest moments in Scripture is anytime you see the Bible say that God gave them over to their own desires. That's when Jesus, when, when God takes his hands off and said, you know what, you can have it. And what a desolate place to be. What a desperate place to be. But that's not the end of the, the text here. We're, we don't have time to read all of verse 3 through 11, but essentially it's a sum, to summarize it, it's, the writer gives us an analogy of God disciplining us as a parent disciplines a child and how discipline can produce holiness and righteousness and the importance of even though it might be painful in the moment it's for our good the same way that parenting your children it might be painful for them in the moment but it ultimately ends up for their good so that covers through verse 11 and then he turns a corner here and in verse 12 it says this it says so because of all of this take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but will become strong. He says, take a new grip. Strengthen your knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet. It almost sounds like a military general, right? Wake up, soldier. Let's go. But why does he take this approach? Why does he get serious? Why does he give this charge? What is the end goal? Here's the why. The Bible says, so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but will become strong. Don't miss it. The writer says that our training, our strengthening, and our commitment to this race of life is not just so that we can finish it on ourselves. It's so that we can help others finish it. It doesn't end with us. The Bible doesn't say, strengthen your hands, tighten your grip, strengthen your knees, mark out a path so you can do it on your own. It says, so that others around you won't fall, so that they'll become strong. Your commitment to running this race, to living out the Christian life, to making your life matter is not just for the glory of God alone, but it's also for the benefit of those behind you. As Ariana Walker last Sunday said, you, you go through to help through, right? The experiences, the things that we walk along the way, the things that we encounter, the, the life that happens to us, we go through those things not just to make it to the other side, but so that we can look back and pull someone else through that too. That's what the writer is saying. The highest reward for a man's work is not what he receives, but who he becomes. And oh, that we would become leaders of people. That the end goal wouldn't be our own success, our own comfort, our own achievement, but that we would make it our life's mission to take people with us. That we're constantly looking back at those who need to be brought home. At those who need to be carried and those who need to follow our path. Even in our house here at Clearview, oh, that our hearts would break for preschoolers and for seven-year-olds. Maybe not for middle schoolers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, that our hearts would break, that it, we wouldn't see it as, oh, we just have to go do this. But no, it's an opportunity to lead people on the road 
that we're looking back and we're pulling people through so that they don't fall. We run this race for the benefit of those behind us. This morning, obviously, we celebrated our, our class of, of 2022, and, and, and we're all crazy proud of them for their accomplishment. But the truth is, they only made it to this day because a whole bunch of folks walked with them on a whole lot of other days. Parrots stayed up all, out, all hours of the night on science fair projects. Teachers stayed after class to help students figure out how and why letters go with numbers in algebra. Coaches did all they could to push each of these kids, instructors, different leaders, to push them to be the best that they could be. But don't miss that. Someone had to take time to look back to extend a hand and to pull them through, to lead them along. And the truth is, there is nothing more fundamental to the function of the church of Jesus Christ than this. That we're looking behind us. We're focused on our race. We're running our race too. But we're not siloed. That we're, that we're burdened for those with us. That we're willing to lead and love and and coach and, and teach and invest in people that need our example to follow. I mentioned earlier I'm, I'm not a runner, uh, and I really have never been. Um, and so there's something about men. They don't typically like running until you give them like a football or a basketball, and all of a sudden they love it. And so for me, that's why I chose basketball. Uh, but for me, I'm not much of a runner, but I worked at a gym in, in uh, my college years, and there was a girl that worked at the gym with us named Elizabeth Hooper. We called her Hooper. And Elizabeth was a runner, um, and she was trying to recruit a group of us that year in Memphis. Uh, there's this big marathon called the St. Jude Marathon. It's a huge one in December every year. There's tens of thousands of people that, that go run this thing for, for St. Jude. And Elizabeth was really trying to get an office group together to go run this marathon, and I just was not having it. Like, man, I'll give whatever money I need to give to St. Jude. as long I'll pay to not run the race. Like, that's where I'm at with this, right? But Hooper is just, he's just, just gassing us up, just trying to get us to do it, and she's trying to convince us in all these different ways. And I said, Elizabeth, I am just not cut out for it. I said, I would make it to like mile like three, maybe. And that thing is 26 miles, right? I, I, I stand no chance at even having the motivation to train or anything like that. I'll never forget what Hooper said. Hooper's not a believer. But I'll never forget what she said. Prophetically, she said, it makes it so much easier to run when you're consistently reminded who you're running for. Because along the roads of downtown Memphis, there are patients from St. Jude. There are families holding posters saying, you can do it. We believe in you. Thank you for running for me. Lined all the, the whole way, 20-something miles, and you're constantly reminded who you are running for. And friends, that's the church, that we're constantly reminded who we run this race for, that it's for the glory of God, yes, and there's obedience, and there's killing sin, and there's all the different things that we have to do to ensure that our race is run with righteousness and with, with completion, but we also run for the benefit of those beside us and behind us. We celebrate the classes 22 today because someone ran with them. And I think if the writer of Hebrews was here today and spoke to the church of Clearview, I think that would be the central part of the message. Who are you leading through the race? You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter. But sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.